Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about healthy versus unhealthy conflicts or, you know, what people like to call fights, but we're going to get into that a little bit. I'm Anna, a clinical psychology doctoral intern, and let's just get straight into it. I've said this before, I don't know, I'm sure some of you are tired of hearing this, but I think that fighting is not normal and inevitable in a relationship. I think when people say that what they mean is conflict or having a divergence of needs is normal in a relationship, sure, absolutely. I don't think you will get any relationship under the sun where there isn't some sort of conflict or divergence in terms of needs and compatibilities. But again, I would call that a conflict or a disagreement or a discrepancy in needs versus I think sometimes people get into the territory of calling it an argument or calling it a fight. And to me, at least from, you know, the type of family and culture that I came from, that has a very different flavor to it. To me, arguing is more of like you're very physiologically heightened, maybe you're yelling, you're having a maladaptive conflict, you know, what will go into this video as being more of an unhealthy conflict. And to me, when I hear fighting, I literally think like verbal, emotional, psychological abuse and other forms of it as well. So, you know, a lot of people say all couples fight, I think because either they were raised in an environment where these conflicts were deeply dysfunctional and they just can't fathom that there exists a different pattern to do things. I think also sometimes people say all couples fight when they really mean all couples have conflict without realizing that some people mean something very different by fight. And also I think we live in a culture that very much normalizes abuse and dysfunctional communication patterns and doesn't really give people the tools to have more healthy communication and conflict. That's where this video comes in. That's what I'm hoping to accomplish with this video is talking about unhealthy versus healthy communication patterns in conflict management. And a lot of what I'll be talking about today draws from my own personal observations as well as John Gottman's research. But I do want to mention, I wonder how culture plays a role in this because I know different cultures have different expectations around how to express emotions or how power is distributed and what is considered respectful. So I do want to say, you know, this is primarily an American uh, research field, but it has been found to be quite applicable across different cultures and yes, also across different forms of relationships, uh, including sexual minorities. From what I know, it hasn't been researched with polyamory. Just a little background about the research. So what does constructive or healthy conflict look like? For me, it has a foundation of respect. You know, you respect yourself, you respect the other person, the other person respects you as well. There is this foundation of no matter what we disagree on, I don't think that you are immorally bad or wrong or I look down on you or I view you with contempt because I ultimately respect you and you respect me. Also, I think in a healthy conflict, no one is getting physiologically flooded. Physiologically flooded means like your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your pupils dilate, you might start to have like shaky hands or cold hands, all the different sensations of a painful emotion, either anger or shame or fear or anxiety, all those different emotions that we would associate with high physiological arousal and kind of a fight, flight, or freeze type of situation. So in a healthy conflict, no one gets to that point, or if they do get to that point, which is perfectly fine, you know, sometimes it happens, the people in the couple know how to soothe themselves and how to soothe each other. So soothing yourself could look like um, just taking a moment saying, hey, I just need to take a breath. I'm gonna go splash some cold water on my face or I'm getting heated. I think I wanna go for a walk. I'll be back in half an hour. Love you, I'll be here soon. Or it could be reminding yourself to breathe and sort of trying to breathe spaciousness into your body, breathe through the pain, um, tensing up your muscles grounding yourself with some sort of grounding skills. So in a healthy conflict, hopefully you don't get to that point where you're flooded, which typically the cutoff for flooded means like heart rate over 100 beats per minute or high blood pressure, or you know, in most cases, it's very visible that you're upset and heightened. Like I remember one time I was wearing my Apple watch, I was feeling really upset over something. My heart rate was 135 and I'm like a very athletic person. So 135, you can imagine how flooded I was in that moment. You do not want to be like that when you're in a conflict with your partner because you can only imagine 
what it would feel like for the other person and for you. You know, if this person keeps um, saying things that further trigger you, you don't want to get to a point where it's unhealthy even physically. So the amount of cortisol secreted when a couple is in conflict actually predicts the outcome of their marriage 10 years later. So people who have high cortisol secretion, meaning they're very stressed out when they're talking to their partner, they tend to divorce in 10 years versus people who had low physiological arousal stayed together in 10 years. This makes sense because when you're very aroused physiologically, <laughs> physiologically, um, it's very hard to concentrate because you're experiencing distress, your line of vision sort of shuts down, you're not perceiving all the information in your environment, you're not listening to your partner, you're not hearing what they're truly saying, you're very much in your own world, you're not feeling safe, you're not empathizing, you're not getting creative about ways to problem solve the situation. So of course that's going to result in negative things for your relationship. And actually people who have a heart rate over 100 who are flooded tend to stonewall more. Stonewalling is basically giving someone the silent treatment or just completely retreating emotionally, just blank stare, not at all engaged in the conversation anymore because it's a form of self-soothing. You know, people tend to stonewall when they're feeling like, I don't wanna be here anymore. I'm just gonna myself as small as possible and not engage in this conversation. And stonewalling is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's what John Gottman calls them. One of the four biggest predictors of whether couples will break up. So if you are stonewalling because you have a heart rate over hundred beats per minute, then it's going to result in negative things for your relationship, understandably, and also going to predict likely breakups. I think in a healthy conflict, this foundation of care and understanding and love and affection for the other person doesn't disintegrate. It stays very much there, no matter what happens. And if it does disintegrate, you have to kind of wonder, did you really love this person in the first place? If you know, it is so easy for you to just snap out of it. I think we've all at some point seen some couple conflicts where people are like really contemptuous towards each other. And it's like, why are you two even together? You don't like each other very much. So the golden ratio that Gottman found, which is the positive to negative affect ratio that you want couples to have during conflict is five to one. So five moments of positivity compared to one moment of negativity. But again, that's during conflict. So you can imagine when you're outside of conflict, you want to create a culture of fondness, admiration, intimacy, friendship, respect, care. You want that to be very imbued in your relationship. In conflict, you want it to stay preserved. You know, maybe there's a little bit more negativity but it stays intact, the foundation of positivity. And couples who have healthy conflict also preempt negativity, and if negativity does show up, they tend to de-escalate it pretty effectively, and they repair ruptures if any happen. So again, it doesn't devolve into the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. If you don't know what that means, I did have an old video on this. It's actually like my first video that blew up, had over a million views but I'm just not happy with it anymore. So I think I'm gonna make a new one. Um, it's part of the pitfalls of being very perfectionistic as a YouTuber is I just hate everything that was made more than three months ago. So I will give you a refreshed version, don't worry. And not only do you want the four horsemen of the apocalypse to not be present, you want their antidotes to be present. Things like expressing gratitude and appreciation, expressing positive regard for the other person, having a gentle startup, you know, like expressing your need in a very positive way that's more well received by the other person. Taking responsibility, self-soothing if you feel yourself disengaging. Couples who have healthy conflict take a gentle approach with each other as if it's something that you don't want to break, something that's precious to you, because of course you want a relationship to be precious to you and you want to communicate that in the way that you have conflict. You don't want to treat it like something you are perfectly fine just shattering and that is impossible to repair. You want to treat it like something that is valuable and delicate because it is. Relationships are delicate. So you want to approach it from the standpoint of instead of saying, what the hell is this? Instead saying, oh, what's this? With a sense of curiosity. I'm sometimes guilty of this. You know, I sometimes... Sometimes I'll throw in a curse word there, not because I'm angry at something, but just because I'm like shocked by a situation. Like, what the f Like, we don't have raspberries anymore. And I've noticed that 
my fiance does get a little bit just more physiologically aroused when I say it that way. Almost like he's interpreting it as an attack on him even when it's not. So it's really important to approach things from a place of curiosity rather than like shock or indignation or something that could be misinterpreted as something negative that's going to get the other person more likely to be physiologically aroused. Something really soft, you know, if you have a concern, bringing it to your partner really gently, maybe like taking their hand, saying, hey, you know, I love you. And just saying, hey, you know, I feel this about the situation that happened. Um, I would like for this to happen next time. Is that okay? And you don't have to say it in such a, you know, like gentle way as I said it. You can imbue your own personality into it, obviously. I'm just trying to evoke what gentleness looks like. But still you wanna send the message that I'm approaching this with curiosity and gentleness because this is valuable to me. In a healthy conflict, people are able to paraphrase what the other person said because they're listening, they're understanding, they're not just thinking about what they're gonna say next. They're paying attention and they're genuinely curious about what their partner is feeling and thinking and needing from them. They're not just seeing their own perspective with blinders on. Couples who have healthy conflict also accept influence from each other. Accepting influence means basically giving in something, conceding, compromising. It could even mean saying, that's a good point, or yeah, maybe you're right about that, or yeah, I probably didn't handle that very well. Just accepting some influence to give your partner some semblance of, I'm listening to you, I understand you, you're not being ridiculous, I think we have some common ground about this. Couples who have healthy conflict also communicate that they accept the other person's personality. There's this sense of, I know who you are, I'm okay with it, I'm not trying to change you. And they also turn toward, I actually have a whole video about what turning towards means because it's a very big predictor of couple outcomes further on. So I will put a card for that up top somewhere and go check it out. Now, unhealthy conflict or what people call arguments or fighting are the exact opposite of that. Scratch everything I said, revert it to its opposite. Lots of negative affect that escalates very quickly. And actually, if it starts out very harsh with a lot of negative affect, 96% of conflicts will stay that way. It's very hard to turn around, so it's really important to have a gentle, soft startup. Not only is it characterized by high negative affect, it's also characterized by low positive affect. And I'm gonna go into this in more detail in a different video, but basically what this means is that you're not seeing a whole lot of affection, warmth, trust, commitment, intimacy, humor. They're not interwoven into the conversation. It's kind of like the negative stuff is all that there is there. And actually that golden ratio of five to one positive to negative interactions is 0.8 to one in unhappy couples and couples who have arguments and fights and unhealthy conflict. People who have fights are also emotionally disengaged. They might be stonewalling as an attempt to self-soothe because they're physiologically flooded. They might be giving you blank stares, retreating inside, emotionally just not connecting, not empathizing, not listening in their own bubble because they just don't wanna hear it. These couples also have incompatibilities in the way that they make meaning of certain things. One person might see their family as their rock, whereas their partner sees that person's family as an anchor tying them down where they can't escape. Both of them are dealing with the same situation. They're looking at the same situation, but from different angles where they're making meaning of it very differently. And it's really important to ask your partner how they're making meaning of a situation, what's informing that meaning for them, you know, past experiences, future dreams, and so forth, and hopefully coming to a place of shared meaning, because if you can't do that, it's just this game of tug and war. And lastly, couples who fight are basically combining contradiction and verbal abuse. Contradiction is everything that your partner says, you believe the opposite is true. You, I'm sure, have been in those conversations where you say, that never happened, I didn't do that, no it didn't, that's not what I mean, you're wrong about that. Everything's a contradiction, everything just happens to be the complete opposite of what the other person is saying. Convenient, right? And verbal abuse is things like intentionally instilling painful emotions in the other person, demeaning them, making it very clear that you don't respect them, that you see them as unworthy or less than you. It could include insults, taking cheap jabs at things that you know are meaningful and hurtful to them, guilting them, shaming them, making them scared, blaming them for everything, yelling at them, completely turning off your empathy for them and getting very callous and not listening to them. Those are the characteristics of an unhealthy conflict or an argument or a fight, however you want to call it. Like I said, I know that there are kind of these 
inconsistencies in how people use these words. But when I say I don't think it's normal for couples to fight, what I mean is I don't think couples should have such unhealthy conflict because it's not good for them and it's likely going to result in divorce or breakups further down. Comment your thoughts under this video. I'll see you in a week. Bye!